Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online message. We've been in this commission series. Last week we took a break from that to do a little bit of Mother's Day time and, and celebrate the moms for Mother's Day. I hope you had an opportunity to celebrate your mom and to be able to do that. Um, we're back into the idea of the commissioned and what we're all commissioned for. Like I said before, we, we worked through the marked series, the idea that we were marked for a purpose so that we saw Jesus' life through that series and the things he did. And then those are the things that we are to do, the things that we should clothe ourselves in, in his character, and then the way that he cared for people for us to be able to walk into that. We went into Easter with the Ransom series and that we were ransomed in order to do something, which was uh, our life was saved through Jesus Christ in order to pass that on to so many others. And that's really where we're at in this commission series. When we say yes to Jesus, we've been commissioned to make disciples. That's where Matthew 28 comes in and it's to go and make disciples. And that's that's where, where we've been. And as we come through, we're in the first part of the book of Acts here, really looking at how the first church was to glean as much as we can. So today we're going to be in Acts 2. Last week, The week before last, it was Pentecost and we looked at what Pentecost meant and, and what happened on that day. And now we're going to look at church in the community that it is. You know, being a Christian is being a part of a community. You know, there, there are rules within a community and um, there's an inward expression outside that uh, we, we have to, to look at. The importance of a community is really overrated a lot of times. There's, um, you know, for a personally, I like to make jokes occasionally because I'm actually an introvert uh, by heart. And so I think a lot about just having a cabin in the middle of nowhere in the woods away from everybody just doing a life and the peace and the quiet kind of living off the land kind of thing but the fact of the matter is is we we are all created to do life with others we're here and created to do it in a, a community and I think sometimes that's really underrated in uh, choosing a church community um, for a long time I, I didn't want to go to church itself as an organized or a local church and there's a lot to be said in engaging in a local church and to have that community with, within. And so um, I, I'm not sure at this point in life where I can find anywhere that um, as a Christian, you don't need community because I believe you do. I believe all of us need that community because we need to be able to be raised up and encouraged. We need to be able to raise up and encourage others. And there's no possible way to actually disciple without being able to do that. So today I want to look at Acts 2, specifically verses 41 through 47, and, and really what the first church was like. And so to connect this this theme, Acts 2 shows us how the Holy Spirit really miraculously reverses this curse that we found that God put on Babel in Genesis 11, and he created this new community through the gospel. And the picture was to, to see this community as really a wonderful reminder of what church should and can be. And so I want to I want to share a little story about Billy Graham that I read at the height of the Cold War. Billy Graham visited Russia to meet with the political and religious leaders of the time. And many leaders in the U.S. actually criticized him for not taking a more prophetic role when he chose to do this. And one occasion, uh, one occasion, someone actually accused him of setting the church back 50 years. And Graham himself responded in his book. He said, I am deeply ashamed. And then he pauses and he says, I have actually been trying very hard to set the church back 2000 years to take it back to what that original community, what the first church was really like, because over the years, it's really easy for it to mold into things that it was never intended to be. Like church exists for a purpose. And so he was very intentional on in what he was doing. So we must not glamorize the early church because it did have its problems, had a lot of problems. As a matter of fact, all the letters that Paul wrote to the other churches, like the Ephesians to the Corinthians, those were letters of uh, really some encouragement, but it was also to get them to make the changes that they needed to make because they were they were making decisions that they shouldn't have but not not really much different than some of the problems that we have in churches today to be honest but being christian does not mean nostalgically looking back at a glory day we should however take a frequent glance back 
and, and look at the early church. Let's look at today uh, what I want to spend time in is how they related to God, how they related to one another, and how they related to the world. And so we find a beautiful picture of how the church with all its imperfections um, can be a, a community like no other. And, and let's consider this in the idea of three postures of the early church, an inward posture, an outward posture, and an upward posture. And that's what I want to work through here today. But let's jump into the scripture so you understand what it says. Acts 2 verses 41 through 47. Now this is right after Pentecost. This is right after Peter uh, has a sermon to everyone right after Pentecost. And this is what happens. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they sold property and possessions to give everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So it's important for us to look at the posture of what church was, because this is the posture that we should have as a church. So the, one of the first postures I want to look at is the, the church, the early church had a healthy inward posture. Now, what I mean about inward is not inward as an individual, inward about the church and the brothers and sisters of Christ. In verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to, to prayer. So we see them devoted to that. We also see in 44 through 46 that then all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another. In need and every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together, glad and sincere hearts. And because of all this, upon receiving baptism, like these 3,000 new believers immediately began devoting themselves to one another. The gospel radically transformed how they viewed their possessions, how they, they viewed their time, and how they viewed even their own identity. I mean, look at, in verse 41, they were a new people. In verse 42, they had this new devotion about them to Jesus. And in verse 44, they were a new community. You know, their compassion, their humility, their joy, um, their mercy, and their devotion could only be attributed ultimately to the power of the Holy Spirit working through the message of the resurrected Savior. So we can't be a community for Jesus Christ without Jesus Christ. And this picture of unity and compassion flies in the face of the radical idea of individualism that often permeates from the church. If we're only caring and focused on ourselves, then we're not focused on each other as a community, as a whole, as a body, as the bride of Christ. You know, many believers make a sharp distinction between their relationship with God and their relationship with the church. And this passage, it doesn't, doesn't give us that luxury. You know, when God saves us, personal devotion to his community is not an option. We are called to be a part of the body. We're called to find our gifts so that we can use them and in the edifying of the body. We're called to disciple, to raise those up in what Jesus has commanded us to do. And we do this in our time, talents, and treasures. You know, that's, that's why weeks ago when I talked about this discipleship pathway and that it's like a pie and we all have a piece of the pie that we're supposed to be a part of, it, it's serving. When we, we look at this as serving, we need to make time for it. It's finding your spiritual gift and using it. That's your talent. And it's tithing. That's your treasure. The Christians must have a healthy inward posture. Sanctification is a community project. It's, it's not just individual. It's us as a whole. And it's not, it's not just... When we look at Israel... Israel was, was looked at as a nation as well, not just the individual. You know, unity comes from the healthy inward posture. 
See, God intended his people to look to one another for encouragement in the gospel. We know that in Colossians 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs. From the Spirit singing to God with great grat gratitude in your hearts and that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. But we're also supposed to have this inward posture and exhortion to endure. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 say, See to it, brother, there's a, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sinful, deceitful news. But then we also have this inward posture and and to fight against the this idea of selfishness because selflessly we we need to be be bearing the burdens of others that they they have to face each and each each day we know that from galatians 6 2 it says carry each other's burdens and in a way you will fulfill the law of christ you know, we, we must consistently resist the me mentality in the body of Christ. So ask yourself this, what is, what is your attitude toward the church? Are your, are your church attendance, financial giving, small group activity, or other kinds of involvement, is that even important to you? And if it's important to you, how important? Rate yourself on what that would be. How can you be a, a blessing to your local congregation? What are ways that you can give in that with your, with your talent, with your treasures or with your time? And are your brothers and sisters in Christ a priority in your prayers and with your time? But the inward posture is not the only one we have to look at. We also, the church had a healthy upward posture as we see as an early church. And we talk upward, it's that to the Lord. In verse 42 and 43, it says that they were devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with the awe at, the t at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So they were devoted to those things. We know in verse 46, 46, that every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, this new community experienced God deeply at such a deep level that people were being transformed and changed because of it. In 42, they were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There, there's no, no doubt included the teaching on how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. You know, as Luke 24, 27 talked about, it was just a, the story of Israel and through his life and death and resurrection, they would have shared about that. The, the main reason why the, the tomb was empty. In verse 43, they experienced this awe and wonder of God's work in the world. And that led to frequent worship in their life. And verse 46, 47 is talking about this celebration in the temple. And we, we learn from the rest of Acts how much the church prayed, how much the church worshipped, how much the church celebrated God's power and presence in their midst. You know, churches should, should protect their posture toward God. You know, church may move through an entire year of sermons, services, and Bible studies and never really experience God because they don't have the right upward posture. In 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter says, like newborn infants longing for the pure spiritual milk. Many interpret Peter here as saying something like longing for the word of God the way an infant longs for milk. And, you know, a lot of times messages and sermons will focus just on that bit. But if Jesus is also the word and Jesus is also God and the Holy Spirit is those things as well, this actually also means more than just get in the word only. He's actually saying, crave Jesus the way an infant craves and needs milk in its life. Do you crave Jesus in that way? Now, the very next verse says in verse 3, if indeed you have tasted that, the Lord is good. 
where they had tasted how good Jesus really was. And Peter encouraged them to keep on tasting him, to keep on understanding and drawing in near. We can't exhaust God in our life no matter what we do. So we must pursue him with all of our might and everything that we're trying to accomplish. So ask yourself, what currently hinders your pursuit of God in your life? Maybe it's your schedule, maybe it's money, maybe it's people, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's laziness, maybe it's, it's selfishness, maybe it's pride. There's all kinds of things that can keep us from pursuing God in our life. Ask yourself how often your church friends or your group uh, come together and pray together. Is that a priority for you? In what ways can our church move closer to him in better ways, make a difference? How might we protect our zeal, our excitement in church and not feel like it's a tomb and there's, there's nothing there, there's no energy, there's no spirit? That's all in our upward posture. And we have to protect that. It should be a right upward posture to the Lord. But there's one more posture I want to talk about that we get out of this scripture, and that's the early church had a healthy outward posture. In verse 47, it says, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, this new community not only moved toward God and each other well, they also moved toward those in the world. You know, the text does not explicitly mention evangelism but however it comes on the heels of peter's sermon at pentecost which is why so many gave their life and were saved and preceded the story of the church expansion you know we go back to acts 1 8 it talks about how throughout all of jerusalem all of judea all of samaria and the ends of the earth verse 47 here they had favor with everyone and that god added to their numbers daily because of that See, God saves people to send them out to engage people with the gospel. We have been saved in order to be sent out to engage people with the gospel. A great way to do that is to eat with people. I mean, eating with people breaks down walls. It helps you to walk in their shoes. It builds relationship. It teaches you who they are and what they've been through in their life. This is how Jesus accomplished much of his mission was breaking bread with people. There's a gentleman by the name of Tom, Tom, Tim Chester, and he talks about how basically we, we have about 21 meals a week if we do three a day. And he says we eat some 21 meals a week. Having one with a non-believer should be a priority for us. Whatever we do, we must strive to help others to know the Savior as we do. So ask yourself, do you have a burden for people who don't know Jesus? Who in your life does not believe the gospel? What will you do to share it with them? Because breaking bread with them is one of the best ways to do that. The early church, even though they were flawed, is really a wonderful, wonderful model for us to shape around. We can see how, they're, how they were inwardly, how they were outwardly, and how they were upwardly in their posture. Because that is what we need to be as a church. The way we can imitate these postures is to challenge ourselves really for this as all churches today. It starts by examining these areas, asking the hard questions and in the end, resting in the gospel to find the strength and motivation to fulfill them. Our, our vision and mission doesn't change, but the methods to do it can. If it doesn't work to do it this way, it doesn't mean that's not still the mission we're headed to. That's not still the vision we're trying to get to till the end. It means the way we were trying to accomplish that just didn't work. So we're just going to try something else, but that doesn't change. This is why Christ gave himself up to create a community like no other community in the world or the world has ever seen. That's what we are supposed to be as the body of Christ. You know, this is why as a church, our purpose is to do the following things, to reach. We reach, that is our outward and upward posture. We're here to raise people up, and that's our inward and upward posture. And we're here to help release people to do what God's asked them to do. That's an, in, that's, that's an inward and an upward posture. 
you notice they all, all, all three of these have upward posture in them because we can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it without giving the glory to God. It has to be him, his power. Great is, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And this is our worship to the Lord. And my prayer for us is that we would be that community. And that comes down to us choosing the right inward posture. That we would love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We would, we would keep unity in that. We would speak well. We don't have to always agree. We don't have to go to all the same churches. But we do need to stand on the hill we would die on that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That forgiveness is necessary and that sin is sin and that needs to be repented in our life. We have to stand on those things, and that is a proper inward posture. We also have to look at keeping the proper outward posture. Like, we're here to reach and make a difference to share the gospel. That's what that community was about. There was added to their numbers daily because it was priority. It was their outward posture of worship. And all of that comes down to our upward posture. We must have the proper praise and gratitude and thanksgiving to the Lord. And so we pray here today for that posture here in our life. Father God, we come to you to change our lives, to change our hearts, Lord, that we would posture rightly to you, to the world, and to our brothers and sisters, Lord. Lord, that we are here to reach those because we have been reached. To share the gospel with those who don't know you, Lord. That we would be out there with the right outward posture. And Lord, that us as brothers and sisters would gather together to pray together, to praise together, to, to carry each other's burdens, Lord. To be there for one another and to help raise each other up, Lord. To learn more and more about you and to be more of a follower of you, Lord. Denying ourselves and taking up our cross. And Lord, that our upward posture be right and righteous, Lord, that you would have the glory and we know where our power comes from. Lord, help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this part of the commission series as we continue with more of it as we carry on. Hope to see you next week.